We've got another offseason upcoming here in year number three of the San Francisco Giants franchise here on MLB The Show 24. In the last episode, our season came to an unfortunate end in the NLCS as we dropped games five and six to Atlanta, who will be going into the World Series. Our offensive inconsistencies caught up to us. In game five, we could not hit the ball at all. Ultimately losing this one 3-0, Atlanta was able to get some runs late. We had a good start from Logan Webb, but the offense really faltered. Munitaka Murakami had three hits, but the rest of the team only had five, and it didn't help the bullpen didn't really perform well, not that it would have mattered. Game six was a lot closer. The offense was quite a bit better. Tommy Rogers led the way with a homer and three walks. J.P. Crawford had a good game. Patrick Bailey had a good game. Mason Miller struggled in his start, but the bullpen did a really good job to where it was tied at three going into the bottom of the eighth, but a solo shot by Matt Olson, his second of the day off of former Brave A.J. Minter, was ultimately the difference, leading Atlanta to the World Series, ending our playoff run. It was still a really fun and successful season. We were just one of two teams in the entire league to win 100 games. We won our first playoff series, and we gave Atlanta a run for their money in the NLCS. But this team still has a lot of work to do. You can argue this team overperformed this year in a lot of ways. And we're going to have to make some changes this offseason to try to better position us for another title run in the future. Before we get started, though, real quick, I want to do very short playoff stud and duds of the year. We're going to give plus one and minus one boosts to two guys who performed really well during the postseason and then punishing two guys who didn't perform well. We'll start with our first playoff stud of the year. This guy seems to just keep getting boosts and boosts and boosts, but look, he deserves it. J.P. Crawford is continuing to outperform his rating and dominate. He won the stud of the year last year. He finished in second place this year, and he was our best player in the postseason. 343 average, three homers, OPS well above 1,000, led the team in war. He was incredible, and he's a free agent at the end of the year. His price tag is continuing to go up. And it looks like he wants to stick around, and he is making a really good argument to get a nice contract extension. I had trouble figuring out the other choice. I thought about Patrick Bailey because he really exceeded my expectations. But I feel like with Bailey being an 83 overall already, this is also partly ratings-based. And with Elliot Ramos being a 73, I feel like he deserves some love. Ramos performed well offensively, kind of a small sample size, but he did play more than Patrick Bailey did. So he'll go up by one as well. He is now a 74 overall. As for our postseason duds of the year, the first one is very predictable. Jonathan India sucked. Three hits the entire playoffs. No walks as well. 111 average, 259 OPS, and he was also one of our worst defenders. His negative .5 war was the worst of any player in the entire postseason. He was a legit liability out there, and by the end, we could barely start him. So he'll go down by one, certainly not ideal considering he as well is a free agent this offseason. Our second postseason dud is a guy who only played in two games, that being because he's a starting pitcher, but Aaron Savale really was not very good in either start, especially the second one, game two against Atlanta, he did not perform well. Savale won the stud of the year in the regular season. He got a plus three ratings boost, so this season was still very successful for his ratings. But I noticed in September, he was really starting to struggle. He was starting to slow down. And well, that ended up coming to form in the postseason. So we're going to have to manage his innings next year because I don't think he can take on a 200 inning workload, clearly. Let's see what happens in the ALCS as the Rangers win in seven. So we'll get a Rangers and Braves World Series with Leody Tavares and Zach McKinstry currently as the postseason MVP front runners. McKinstry feels wild being there, but he was really good against us. He legitimately deserves it. Game one goes to the Rangers. Rough start for Dylan Cease, but Atlanta takes game two. We're tied at one. Pivotal game three goes to the Rangers in a close one. Atlanta takes game four, though. We're going back and forth. Game five, Huascari Noah, Corbin Burns, low scoring game, goes to the Rangers with a walk off hit in the 11th inning by the veteran Marcus Semyon. Into game six, King versus Paddock. Atlanta survives. They win 3 0 with a great performance from Michael King to save the season. And now, this is it. Game seven, John Means against the legend Jacob deGrom, looking to cement his legacy as a Hall of Famer, and he does not get it done. The Braves win the World Series 4-1. to 
They got all their runs in the second with an RBI from Arcia and a three-run triple for Acuna. John Means was incredible while DeGrom led up four runs, but here's the thing. None of them were earned. It was because of an error by Ezekiel Duran, which ultimately led the runs to score. Orlando Arcia ends up winning the World Series MVP, and now this Braves core has won two championships over the last half decade. And with that, we are ready to start the 2026 going into 27 offseason. That starts with retirements. Nobody from our organization is calling it a career. Not many notable big leaguers here really at all. Maybe Kyle Higashioka, Jake Cave, David Dahl. Yes, Monty Grandal and Charlie Blackman are pretty relevant. In terms of notable free agents, there were quite a few here. Chris Bassett, Mark Boyd, Mark Canna, Mike Clevenger, Patrick Corbin. Some interesting ones coming up here. The former Cy Young, Kyle Hendricks, Kenley Jansen, Clayton Kershaw is done. A longtime rival of the Giants. Kershaw, one of the pitchers who defined this generation, playing his entire career with the Dodgers. Easily one of the best arms to ever do it. And without a question, will be a first ballot Hall of Famer. Joining him, Kevin Kiermeyer, Kenta Maeda, Adam Adovino, James Paxton, Tommy Pham, Brett Phillips, salute. Carlos Slam Tana is done. Gene Segura retires as well. And we've got another big one coming up with another one of the all-time greatest pitchers to ever do it. Julio Tehran. No, I'm kidding. Justin Verlander retires. Obviously a legend with the Tigers and the Astros. Who does he go into the Hall of Fame with? Detroit or Houston? Obviously, I want to say the Tigers. But I feel like with what he did in the Astros, helping them win some championships, his plaque, unfortunately, probably will have an Astro hat. Joey Votto officially retires as well. Ironic, because he just announced it in real life a couple days ago. Those three guys are easy Hall of Fame choices. However, surprisingly, Joey Votto was left out. I can't get behind that at all. Joey Votto was snubbed. But Kershaw and Verlander makes it. It looks like Verlander's in as a Tiger. Love to see it. And with that, we are now officially into the offseason itself. And we've got some decisions to make because this is an older roster. Tommy Rogers, by the way, now 19 years old. Our draft picks are now here, and that includes first rounder Johnny Hackman, who's obviously a guy who I think can compete for a roster spot right away since he's an 80 overall. But we've got a lot of guys who are free agents. It is an older core. And as you can see, this is close to half of our big league roster who is not under contract for this upcoming season. Now, luckily, we don't have a lot of money tied up. Really, only six guys are under contract this year, and obviously, we've still got renewables and arbitration to go through. But other than Munitaka Murakami, John Hoodley, and Logan Webb, we don't have many big deals. And being that we are a pretty big market team, we've got a lot of money to spend. So among our notable free agents, we've got three position players of J.P. Crawford, Jorge Soler, and Jonathan India, starting pitcher Robbie Ray, and then pretty much the entire bullpen, other than Camilo Duvall and Yariel Rodriguez. So we'll start with J.P. Crawford. This one's a no-brainer. There is no doubt about it that J.P. Crawford needs to be back on this team. He's one of the most important players on this roster. We would be foolish to let him go, and I'm not even going to entertain the idea. He needs to be brought back because he's one of the two or three most important position players on the squad. I don't want to give him a five-year deal. He is 32. I think a three-year, $30 million deal with a mutual option is pretty fair. Now, realistically, he should be asking for way more money, probably double that, to be honest. But I think considering what the rest of the shortstop market is, that's pretty reasonable. As for the other position players, we'll start with Jorge Soler, who obviously did not play at all in the playoffs due to an injury. He has a very defined role. He's hit 100 home runs exactly over the last three years. His power is his calling card. He's one of the best power hitters in baseball, but there's not a whole lot else he does. He doesn't hit for average. He doesn't draw walks. He doesn't play defense. And he was a guy who I was planning on trading last offseason, but ultimately he ended up sticking around. He had a pretty good season for us, but we're super crowded in the outfield. John Hu Lee, Tommy Rogers, Stone Garrett. We've got Elliot Ramos, Kyler Rodriguez, Johnny Hackman, and even guys down the board like Connor Bishop, George Groniga, Luis Matos, Brendan Davis. That's a lot of guys. And because of that, I feel like we don't really need Jorge Soler. I want to build more of a defensive-minded team. And keeping a guy like Soler doesn't really make sense. So I think for now, we're going to let him go. As for Jonathan India, I was on the fence on this one going into the playoffs because I think he's an important player. He's been one of our best hitters over the last two years with a combined war of 7.4. He was really bad in the playoffs, but 
It was a super small sample size. It was only 27 at bats. I think we're going to let him hit the open market. I think Crawford's obviously better between the two of them, but I'm not opposed to bringing India back once free agency starts. Robbie Ray, I thought, had a really good season. You cannot ask for much more from your number five, but he's 35 years old. He recently had Tommy John surgery. I would rather get younger. And we've got a lot of talented young arms in the system, guys who are going to be competing to join the rotation, most notably Scott Rios and, of course, Fernando Molina as well, who I think is pretty close to being ready. It's also supposed to be a pitching-heavy free agency class, so because of that, I'd rather get someone younger and maybe a little bit better than Robbie Ray, but I still feel like he was very valuable this year for his role. And then the bullpen. Most of these guys individually were pretty good, but the bullpen as a whole was not clutch. We need to revamp this unit. I think of the five, the only guy who I definitely, no questions asked, want to bring back is Daniel De Los Santos. I think he was the most reliable of this group. Two years, $4.6 million as somebody who can eat innings in the middle. I think that's a steal for us. And I think that's the only offer we're going to give right now. I'm not opposed to bringing back some combination of these four. James Karinchek, I think, would be a good guy to bring back. I want high leverage arms within the bullpen. Guys who are clutch. Guys who can perform with runners on base. And I think Karen Check does that. Genesis Cabrera, another guy who I would not be opposed to bringing back. I know the ERA is high, but he's been a target of mine for a while. And I think he was just unlucky at times this year. Not to say he's some star, but I think his numbers would look better next year if he returns. Michael Kopech was really disappointing, but I still see some long-term upside with him considering his potential is in the high Bs. Nonetheless, he was awful with us after the trade deadline. And then AJ Minter, he was probably the reliever I trusted the most other than Camilo Duvall, but he also led up the big home run to Matt Olson. He was a little inconsistent down the stretch, plus he's 33 years old. So we're only going to offer two contracts right now, J.P. Crawford and Daniel De Los Santos. Everybody else will hit the open market. But again, I'm not opposed to bringing back a lot of those guys. We do have an open spot on the staff with our third base coach. And let's hire a guy who everybody in the clubhouse loves. Who doesn't adore Ron Washington? Now, he's a little bit older. He's 74. So I'm only going to give him a one-year deal. But he's the perfect third base coach. And I think he'd be a great hire. So ultimately, he will sign with us, helping bring some vibes to the team, along with the fact that he's a pretty good coach to begin with. And that brings us now to the start of the actual offseason. As you can see, J.P. Crawford and Daniel De Los Santos are not there. That means they have both re-signed. So Crawford is back, three years, $30 million. That was the number one priority for us going into the offseason, and we got it done quickly. And Yelde Los Santos is also back. That's a big deal. So at least we have a little bit of continuity in the bullpen going into free agency. So here we go. 40-man roster selection, arbitration, renewable contracts, and of course, the big dog, free agency, which we'll be talking about in a little bit. Let's go through the dirty work real quick first. For 40-man roster selection, I'm only going to add one player, that being Brennan Davis, who was acquired in a trade last year. He's 27. I don't think he's some long-term starter, but I think he's a good player to have his depth, and I don't want to lose him in the Rule 5 draft. As for arbitration, I'm going to offer everybody here, other than Brian Baker and Tristan Beck, I didn't want to offer any of these guys long-term deals. I thought about Stone Garrett, but we've only had him for a couple months, and he wasn't good in the playoffs. I thought about Kyle Harrison, but I didn't want to pay him when his value was at its absolute highest, given his inconsistencies over his first two years. As for Baker and Beck, I just don't really trust these guys a whole lot, and I want the bullpen to be as good as possible, so we're going to let them hit the market. As for contract renewables, pretty much everybody here I'm going to bring back. I thought about a long-term deal for Tommy Rogers, but I want some more immediate financial flexibility now. And I also want to see Rodgers do it for another year. As good as he was this year, as good as he was in the playoffs, he still has some very clear weaknesses. And I want to see him at the very least make some strides in those areas. And then I'll feel comfortable with giving him $300 million. Obviously, he's our franchise player and I'm confident he's going to be able to do it. But I'd rather do it in like July of next year rather than right now. So with that, we've got plenty of money available, only $114 million tied up, albeit that doesn't count arbitration and renewable deals, but it's a good class. As I mentioned, very pitching heavy, and we now have a hole with our fifth starter. The bullpen looks really good. In terms of position players, it's a little bit weaker. There's not like a Juan Soto type of megastar, but there are some really good players here, headlined by Jazz Chisholm, Dalton Varshow, Nico Horner, and Hassan Kim. 
My top priority is adding another arm. I like the guys we got in the system, but we need to add another veteran to, at the very least, compete with them. And I think giving Tristan McKenzie a one-year prove-it deal makes some sense. He's got all the talent in the world, but he has not been consistent at all in Cleveland. The Guardians want to bring him back, but I think this makes a lot of sense for McKenzie. One year, show everybody that I am an all-star level player, and then get the bag next year if all goes well. As for the bullpen, it's pretty empty. We need a lot of guys here. I want to make a splash, and I think JoJo Romero is a really good option. He had a career year. I don't love that we're buying high, but he's really not that expensive, and I think given his price, he's absolutely worth it. We're going to offer Genesis Cabrera as well. I wanted to make sure that we got a couple of lefties early, so that's why I'm offering Cabrera now along with Jojo Romero. As for some position players, there aren't a ton of supernatural fits here. Tyro Estrada would be kind of an interesting one, but he was just never consistent enough offensively. There's Jonathan India, of course. But I want someone who's well-rounded at the plate, who can play good defense, and preferably somebody in the infield, because again, we're super crowded in the outfield. That was the whole talking point with Jorge Soler. It would be funny if we brought back Matt Chapman, especially considering he would probably replace Jonathan India, but I don't think that's likely. I don't really want to spend big on a guy like Hassan Kim. Of the big name free agents, the one that I'd want to spend the most on would probably be Dalton Varshell because he is a really good defender. Unique offensive skill set, but I'm about it. Had a great season at the plate last year of Toronto, but he's not an infielder. He's an outfielder who can catch. We don't need outfielders and we don't need catchers. So I'm not going to offer any position players now. I want to see how the market plays over the first couple of weeks. Brian Abreu immediately signs with Seattle. That's interesting. He got a lot of money considering he was inconsistent last year, but he is staying in the American League West going to the Mariners. Otherwise, there weren't a ton of super notable deals. Hey, Luzardo gets a big extension with the Marlins, but we ended up getting one of the first few guys who we offered, that being Jojo Romero. So he is now going to join the bullpen on a two-year deal. I think he's going to replace A.J. Minter, and I think he's better than A.J. Minter. So he's basically going to be the second in command behind Camilo Duvall. And it's a little bit of a risk, considering he's only really had one great season. But I think this is somebody who's on the rise and will be worth his contract. Otherwise, here's what the rest of the market looks like. Jazz Chisholm might be a Yankee, which is ironic. The Cubs are going to try to get both Nico Horner and Hassan Kim. That would be quite the middle infield. I took a look at Yandy Diaz. I wouldn't mind a player like him. I think this is the offensive skill set we're looking for, but he doesn't play defense. I want somebody who can field because we've got a couple of guys who are not particularly good defensively. Jose Alvarado signs with the Red Sox, four years, 32. Considering the Brian Abreu deal, I think that's really good value for Boston. And then Dalton Varshell signs with Milwaukee. I think that's a really nice deal for them. So with that, I want to go back in the market. I want to take another look at some of these relievers. And we'll start with James Karinchak. As I mentioned, I do think he'd be a good player to bring back. We're going to offer him one year for $6 million. I like John Schreiber with the Royals. He's been a little inconsistent throughout the series, but he's a good veteran. His worst year of the series came with his least amount of innings. So I'm hoping that it was just more of a fluke. We're going to give him one year for 3.5. A rating that I was really focused on was pitching clutch. I want guys who, again, can give us high leverage innings. Dylan Tate's pitching clutch is 98. I really like Dylan Tate in this game. It's like tradition at this point that he always ends up on my roster at some point. He was in our franchise in MLB 21 with the Orioles. I'm pretty sure at some point he was in our MLB 22 franchise with the Guardians, and he definitely was in our MLB 23 franchise with the Marlins. So I think this is now four years in a row with Dylan Tate, assuming he accepts the contract. One year, 3.3. I think he's the perfect fit as a middle reliever who can get us out of some jams. So these are going to be our offers. No Genesis Cabrera here anymore because he has now accepted our deal as well and is officially back. Tarek Skubal to the Royals. Six years for 117. So he leaves the Rays to return to the American League Central, joining the Royals, who obviously made some trades, getting the pitching rotation worse last year at the deadline. And now they make a big splash with Skubal. Evan Phillips to the Braves, while Trevor Rogers goes to the Padres. So two NL contenders add some pitching, while Jonah Heim ends up with the Yankees. I wonder what happens with Austin Wells now. As you can see, we have no pending offers. Everybody is accepted. Tristan McKenzie, for now, is the fifth starter in the rotation. And then the bullpen looks quite nice with Karen Jack, Schreiber, and Tate all accepting. 
The pen looks pretty good. I think it's going to be a little bit better than it was last year. We're going to continue to simulate now into the month of December. Kyle Wright returns to Atlanta for five years, $57 million. The Braves wanted to make that rotation a little deeper. They saw what happened when Strider got hurt in the playoffs. Well, they won the World Series, but still, they don't want that to happen again. Alejandro Kirk signs with the Marlins, big deal, while Ryan Jeffers also going to the NL East. He is now a Washington National, big loss for Minnesota. The Phillies lose Garrett Crochet after just half a season. He is going to the Toronto Blue Jays, four years for $64 million. And then the Brewers with another big splash. They land Ryan Mountcastle. I like seeing Milwaukee spend. They're just a couple years removed from winning the World Series. They kind of started to tear down their core a little bit at the deadline, and now they're looking to compete once again. Ha Sun Kim is a cub! Six years for 120, and they did re-sign Nico Horner, so now they've got Horner at second and Kim at short. That is quite the middle infield, but where does Dansby Swanson go? Cody Bellinger is a Ray, Albert Elzele is a Marlin. And that will bring us to MLB Winter Meetings, which includes the Rule 5 Draft and the MLB Draft Lottery. So we'll start with the Lotto. Obviously, we will not move, considering we were a playoff team. We will have the 28th pick in the first round. I'm hoping to get some movement here at the top, but that really would not end up being the case. The 51 and 111 Rockies get the number one pick. The Mets and Angels both jump off. They've both had a lot of lottery luck in this series. And it's the Nationals who get screwed going from 2-6 to six, while everybody else stays in place. Now we've got the Rule 5 draft as Jose Urquidy signs with the Nationals. So even though Washington got screwed over by the lottery, they're spending some money with him and Ryan Jeffers. Tyler O'Neill is a Yankee, and with that, the Rule 5 draft is now here. We had nobody selected here in the first round, and I'm not going to pick anybody. There's nobody I really wanted. Nobody else will be selected, and that'll wrap up an uneventful Rule 5 draft. So now with that, the pitching rotation is set, the bullpen is set, but I want one more impact bet. I figured I'd start by looking at free agency. Jazz Chisholm would be kind of perfect because I want an infielder. He can play the infield. He's a really good defender, and I think offensively he's good enough. The problem is he can't hit lefties. We have a lot of lefties in the lineup, and we have a few guys who really cannot hit lefties, and that's kind of the deal breaker. Otherwise, I'd be happy to bring Jazz Chisholm in. Obviously, we had him in the Marlins franchise last year. He was an MVP-level player. I wouldn't expect that to be the case here, but if only he was average against lefties, I think he'd be a perfect fit for us. Then I figured I'd take a look at the trade market. Anyone who is between 23 and 32 years old, pretty good against lefties, pretty good defensively. And the list ended up being a little bit bigger than I expected. I'm more so curious by the guys on the bottom. And we've got a few names here, Patrick Bailey, Stone Garrett, Jun Hu Lee. But in terms of potential trade candidates, there really aren't many good ones. So I decided to make my qualities a little bit more lenient. And there were a couple more names I was interested in. The one that I'm most intrigued by in terms of the trade would be Ezekiel Duran with the Rangers. I think we might have talked about him last year during the deadline. Duran was awesome in 2025. He was one of the best players in baseball. Made the All-Star team. He was electric. But this year, he was not so good. Power's down. Contacts are down. Defense was better. He won a gold glove. But he also had the error in Game 7 of the World Series, which is the reason why the Rangers lost. And I could see them looking to deal him because of that. Another name who I kind of overlooked in free agency who could work is Orlando Arcia from Atlanta. Good contact, pretty good power, pretty good defense, consistent over the last three years, and he performs in the big moments, having won the World Series MVP. I thought you could trade for players who weren't under contracts, but apparently you can't, so I cannot make a deal for Duran right now. I decided to look at Isaac Paredes with the Rays. I definitely remember looking at him last year at the trade deadline. Big time power bat, good contact, inconsistent defense. He was a gold glover in 2025, but a really bad defender last year, but he's not under contract. So again, can't make a trade right now. So we're going to go to Orlando Arcia. I think a one-year deal for a little over 10 a year, actually 11, makes sense. I think he'd be a good fit for us, and we're prying him away from Atlanta, which is a win. Patrick Sandoval signs with the Brewers, another big pickup from Milwaukee, and that looks like a really team-friendly deal. The Brew Crew continuing to kill it this offseason. The NL Central is one of the only divisions in baseball where I feel like all five teams have a real shot to compete. That brings us into the start of January into the new year. 
So back in December, when I had talked about the possibility of signing Orlando Arcia, I never actually gave him a contract. I was still only considering it at that point, but he is still available here in free agency. His market is still only Atlanta. And I think I want to pull the trigger. I think it makes a lot of sense for us. I'm not entirely sure how much I want to give him. I originally said 11, but I think we can get him for a little bit less. Again, keep in mind, World Series MVP. He knows how to play in the big moments. And he really checks off all the boxes offensively. Hits lefties well. Good contact. Good power. Pretty good at drawing walks. High clutch rating. He's not some gold glover, but he's a good enough defensive player. So we're going to meet in the middle. One year, 10.3. I think that's pretty fair. And with that, we will continue to simulate, hopefully able to pry him away from Atlanta. As Dustin May signs with Minnesota, big signing for the Twins. They've lost a bunch of notable pieces this offseason. Brady Sr. to the Rays, replacing Tarek Skubal. And with that, Orlando Arcia is not here. He has signed with the Giants. So we've got our middle infield for the next, well, year, I guess, with J.P. Crawford and Orlando Arcia with Leover Peguero as kind of the third man behind them. I think Arcia gives this team exactly what it needs. Another quality bat who can play pretty much every day, who's going to be consistent. Maybe not a star, but a quality veteran starter. Now, I will say, Arcia is not some slam dunk. And I think I kind of want one more bat to really round out this lineup. Because all we've done offensively is lose Solaire and replace India with Arcia. I think Arcia is an upgrade but not by that much. I think making another splash would really put this offense over the edge. So I went back to free agency and took another look at Yandy Diaz. I'm okay now if the player we're getting isn't as good defensively because this player can be a primary DH. So Yandy Diaz is very much on the board. I looked at Jorge Soler as well, but I'd rather someone who hits for good contact as well. So I went back to the player finder. Clearly my requirements were a little bit too high here so we're going to make them a little bit more lenient but again there's not many choices here so we're going to try to make them even more lenient and i think i found the perfect person and the best part about it he's a free agent we don't even have to trade for him ian happ is the perfect fit good contact good power draws walks he is a good defender he plays five different positions and he's a switch hitter. We don't have any switch hitters. He has been so good over the last two years. His combined war is almost 12. In 2025, he missed a lot of games, but he still hit for an OPS close to 1,000. This year, 294, 32 homers, 103 RBIs. How has he not been signed? Two years, $36 million. I would be happy to pay you that. He's a utility guy who hits from both sides of the plate and doesn't have any weaknesses. Freddie Peralta to Cleveland, five years, 91. I'm surprised the Yankees didn't offer him that. Freddie Peralta led baseball in pitching war last year. The Yankees gave up all that just to let him go. Ian Happ, meanwhile, is officially signed with us, and I think this is going to be our biggest addition of the offseason. Two years for almost $37 million with a player option. I think this can be one of our best hitters. I don't know where he's going to play defensively because he can play so many positions, but we're going to make it work. And the Cubs are going to make it work too, because they will be upgrading from Ian Happ to Jazz Chisholm. Six years, 105. Big off season for the Cubs, adding him and Hassan Kim. It looks like Chicago once again will be at the top of the National League standings, while San Diego has lost a lot of guys this off season, including Jazz. So that brings us into February. Arbitration hearings are here. With that, we can now simulate to the end of the month. Normally, this is where I would make trades, but as I mentioned, I don't need to make any trades because Ian Happ was the perfect fit for what we needed, and I think our roster is in a good spot. But let's look at the guys who left the Giants. Where are they now? Robbie Ray signs with the Astros. This makes a lot of sense. A contending team looking for a fifth starter. A.J. Minter joins former Giants Scott Barlow and Jose LeClerc in the bullpen with the Phillies. Michael Kopech signs with the Yankees. He'll likely eat a number of innings for them. Jonathan India signs with the Rockies, so he stays in the NL West. They have a crowded infield, and I don't know where he's going to play, but obviously he's going to play. And then Jorge Soler signs with the Red Sox. That's a really interesting fit with the green monster. Obviously, he hits the ball hard. He hits the ball high. I'm curious to see how that goes. And with that, we're going to wrap up the episode. Next time around will kind of be part two. We're going to go over the Roki Sasaki sweepstakes. I haven't talked about him at all today. 
because I wanted to save it for the next episode along with the rest of the international subscriber made free agents. We're also going to go over some trades around the league as well as spring training to figure out what our roster is going to look like, specifically if our first round draft pick out of the University of Michigan, Johnny Hackman, will make the initial 26-man roster. So I hope everybody enjoyed the episode. Make sure to leave a like and subscribe to the channel if you are new. Peace out.